Father, we thank you today and we bless your name. We glorify you because we know you are a mighty God. You have not changed. You are the same forevermore. You are the Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. And what you did in days gone by for people like us, you are going to do for us today in Jesus' name. Our hope and expectation is high. Our faith is centered on you. And we believe today you will magnify yourself and honor our faith. And you will bless everyone in Jesus' name. This is the day you'll break our yoke. This is the day you'll heal our sicknesses. This is the day you'll pour your blessing upon us. And we are praying it will be so in Jesus' name. Bless all your people today. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Today we begin with David, the unconquerable David. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 12 and verse 13. And he said, and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with that of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Arise, anoint him, for this is he. The Lord was looking for a man. A man that will be able to deliver the people of God from the harassment of the Philistines. The Lord was looking for a man. A man that will stand as a representative of the Lord. Both in the nation of the people of God and among or in front the enemies of the people of God. And eventually found David. And then he said, Arise, Samuel. And pour the anointing oil on him. Because this is he. If the Lord can find you today as a man. If the Lord can find you today as a woman. And the Lord can say, this is he. The hope of your community. The hope of people around you. This is she. The one the Lord has been looking for. The one that will mop the ground. And the one that will, uh, that will rout the enemy. The one that will conquer the things that face the people of God. This is he. What are we saying about David? Number one, he was called. Number two, he was chosen. Number three, he was anointed. Those three words and those three things that took place in the life of David. Called, chosen, and anointed. How important that is. The anointing came upon him. And as the anointing came upon him, you, that's what I've read to you in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And then in the very next chapter. We find Goliath standing at the gate between him and the fulfillment of his calling. And I'm going to tell you today, anytime the Lord calls and chooses and anoints, there will be something standing between you and the fulfillment of that calling. That thing you'll find out if you have not found out already. will want to challenge the call of God upon your life. Called, you are called to repentance. Called, you are called to righteousness. Called, you are called to redemption. And as the Lord calls you, and then you respond to that call of God, then you are chosen. The people who are chosen are the people who respond to the call. And then as the calls and chooses, then he says, don't go yet. For you to be able to do everything the Lord has called you to do right in front of you. There is something that you need. That is the anointing of the Spirit of God. 
We're told in verse 13 of that first Samuel, chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. As you have seen, a man called, chosen, and anointed. And yet you understand, the anointing does not make you to be or to sleep on a bed of roses for the rest of your life. The anointing actually gets you up and makes you to be able to face what will try to challenge the call of God in your life. What will challenge the choice of God in your life? What will challenge the anointing of God upon your life? That's why you find chapter 17 following immediately after chapter 16. But before I go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, chapter 17, come to New Testament, the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you are wondering now, am I called? You are wondering now, am I chosen? You might be wondering, am I anointed? How does a man get called? How does a woman get called? How do you know the choice of God in a man's life, in a woman's life? How do you know whether he's called and chosen and anointed? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren. Stop there for a moment. You see your calling, brethren. If you are a brother or a sister, because in the language of the New Testament, brethren are brothers and sisters. They are the people who have turned away from their sin. And they have turned unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And they believe in the work, vicarious work and sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And they believe that Jesus died for them. And all those people who have responded to that call of repentance, they are the people that are called to be brothers and sisters. As many as received him, to them he gave power. To them he gave authority, to them he gave the right, to, get, to them he gave the privilege to become the sons of God, even as many as believed on his name. And if you have turned away from your sin, and you have believed and trusted in the name of Jesus, and you have called upon that name, and as a result of calling upon that name, your sins are forgiven, and the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart that you are saved, that your sins are forgiven, that you are a child of God, you are one of the brethren, and you see your calling brethren. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Called chosen, anointed, not many wise men. David was not considered as being qualified for the call, for the choice, for the anointing. That's why when Samuel got to that house, and then Samuel said, where are your children? God wants to choose one out of them to lead this nation Israel. The father Jesse did not think that David amounted to much. He felt he wasn't qualified. He was belittled. He was neglected. He was pushed aside. And the Lord is reminding us that you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men, that is wise according to the flesh, wise in the natural, I lay instructed, educated Elijah in the community, not many wise men. And then it says, not many mighty, not people who are strong in themselves, 
not people are mighty in themselves, not many mighty. And then it says, and not many noble are called. If you have been looking at yourself and you say, it looks like I am nothing. I am a nobody. I am not wise. I am not mighty. I am not noble. You are the right material for the call of God and for the choice of God. In verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. You understand? Not many wise men, if they are not wise, who are they? They are foolish. The Lord has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak. You understand? If they are not mighty, if they are not strong, then they are weak. The Lord has chosen the weak things of the world to confound things that are mighty. And the base things, you understand? If they are not noble, in verse 26, then in verse 28, they are base. The base things of the world and the things which are despised. As God chosen, yea, and things which are not, things which are not, things which are not, that those things which are not were called non entities. When you join them together, we call them non entities. They are nothing in themselves, they don't have any strength of their own and they don't have any qualification or quality of their own things which are not the non-entities the non-entities he has chosen them to not the things which are that no flesh should glory in his presence that tells us then if you have seen yourself no might no wisdom no power, no strength, and you are a bundle of weakness, a bundle of nothingness. Then you respond to the call of God, the call to repentance, the call to righteousness, and the call to redemption. Once you give yourself, and you give yourself away unto the Lord, of course, for you to say, I'm not wise, I'm not noble, I'm not mighty. For you to say, I am foolish, I am weak, I am base. That will take humility. And it's those people who are humble that the Lord calls and chooses and anoints. And he tells us when you come to the Lord like that. The Lord actually, after he has called, after he has chosen, and after he has uh, brought you to himself, then he anoints you. We're looking at First John, First John, chapter two, verse twenty-seven. First John, chapter two, verse twenty-seven. Here is what the Lord is telling us, but. The anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Anointing. He has called you. He has chosen you. He has anointed you. And the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. You see, there are people, they don't understand that if you are called and you respond to the call, and then you are chosen and you give yourself to the choice of the Lord. And what comes after that is that he anoints you and that anointing abides. And once you realize that the anointing abides, you will not be going about looking for somebody still to anoint you and still to lay hands on you or still to fall under the anointing you keep on standing in the anointing you keep on remaining in the anointing you keep on abiding in the anointing actually you negate the anointing in your life when you are going about looking for another anointing it means that you don't believe you have the anointing already but the anointing that bursts the yoke abides upon your life 
and it says, thereby the, the anointing that we have received actually receive, remains and abides in us. And today, that anointing will break every yoke. I said the anointing will break every yoke. And you see now, in the case of David, called, chosen, and anointed, that anointing will be challenged. Yes, I think that's why many people are running about. You don't understand that when the anointing comes upon your life, some challenges come, some difficulties come, some Philistines come, some Goliaths come. And as a result of their coming, that's why many people abandon the anointing they have, the calling they have, the choice they have. And then they're going about looking for another thing. Understand, the anointing will always be challenged. Goliath was coming against him now. And if he overcame this Goliath, that will open the door for him to overcome all the other enemies. Goliath was standing at the gate, overcoming Goliath. In this chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, will open the door for a lifetime of overcoming. On the other hand, being defeated by Goliath at this time will end his life, will end his ministry, will end every prospect, every possibility of success in the future in his life. That's why this gateway into the blessing, this gateway into the victory, this gateway into the overcomer's life was very important for David and it's very important for you and for me. The unconquerable David. What made him to be unconquerable? I'm going to look at this message under three subtitles. Number one, the characteristics of unconquerable David. The characteristics of unconquerable David. If you can find out what made him to be unconquerable, the characteristics he had, the qualities of life he possessed, then you can say, by the grace of God, I am going to have the same. The same qualities, the same characteristics. And once you have those same characteristics, if it was unconquerable, you too, you'll be unconquerable in Jesus' name. But what if you don't understand the people or the things that stand like Goliath before you, wanting to destroy you, wanting to overcome you, if you don't understand who the enemy is, you'll be fighting shadows. And then you'll not be able to have the victory in your life. That's why we come to point number two. The combatants against unconquerable David. The combatants against unconquerable David. Number three, conquering like unconquerable David. Conquering like unconquerable David. I come to number one, the characteristics of unconquerable David. What did God see in David?